Alrighty. Hi everyone, I'm America Josh and every single month we have been running webinars where we talk about issues that affect expats and people who have moved to the States. They might be living here, they might be temporarily here and today we're going to be talking about housing. So a lot of you will have been renting, some of you are looking at buying. So we've called this one buying property in the US as an expat advice for an Australian's new home. Now what we've done is we want to talk about everything from the concepts at the very, very beginning of the process like social security and, and credit and building up the portfolio and profile that sort of tell a story about who you are. And then we're going to work through and we're going to talk about the actual nuts and bolts of buying a place and the considerations you need to make and the costs that are involved. So what we've gotten at today is a fantastic panel of experts in all sort of the different aspects that are involved with buying a home. Each of our panelists are experts in their field, but we're also going to make this a bit more of a conversation. So we're going to skirt back and forth and, and ask questions of all of them to make sure we've covered all of our bases. There is the Q&A option available uh, at the bottom of the screen. So if you are watching and you do have a question, we are more than happy for you to send that through to me and I'll, I'll ask that of the panelists as we get time. But we've also taken the questions that you've submitted and we're going to fold them all uh, into the course of our, our webinar. So thank you again for joining. I'm going to introduce our guests today. So we've got Rob Schlitterer is a licensed associate uh, sorry, a licensed associate real estate broker at Compass and comes with, I mean, a huge amount of experience, has done the whole process himself. Uh, so Rob, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having us all here. Really appreciate it. Not a problem. Uh, Jesse Cohn is the special counsel at HH and K attorneys in New York and focuses on the transaction side of real estate. So representing both buyers and sellers of co-ops, condos and homes. So not to mention leasing as well, right, Jesse? That's correct. Excellent. So you've got everything covered. Fantastic. And Keith Fuhrer is the <laughs> VP you, of Jeff. sales at Guardhill Financial LLC. And he's the man that talks about the money. He's the finances, he's the rates, he's the loans, he's the lenders. And he has a deep understanding of not only the, the financial side, but also the legal side. So it really brings us, brings us home and talks about you know, actually getting the money and the finance, which Keith, I imagine is a, you know, relatively fundamental to what we're going to be talking about tonight. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. So we've divided up tonight into four distinct categories. We've got immigration and relocation basics. We've got the financial preparation and lending. We've got the home buying process and then the legal and logistical aspects. So we've tried to build it through as a process flowing from the sort of getting yourself ready, preparing your finances, buying the place and then checking all the boxes. And then we're going to go to, we've got a few extra questions. We've got uh, a few things that we can answer that don't quite fit into the boxes that, uh, that we've set up. One thing I do want to flag before we get started is that we had a couple of questions around the tax system. Now, none of our experts tonight are tax professionals. Some, there are lots of considerations to make when it comes to tax and, and you do need to be aware of those. But we want to highlight that you should speak a tax professional, an individual tax professional, and you should ask them your questions because the problem is that we're all very different. We've all got our different backgrounds, our different stories, our different statuses, and we can't answer tax questions that would be effective for all of you. So we will work through and in some cases we will be able to flag that there might be tax considerations to make, but we won't be talking about the actual taxes that might be going into the process. So Rob, I, I want to start with you because you've got the sort of overarching big picture 30,000 foot view. I want to start with a lot of people might have rented, um, a lot of people might be sort of coming in with that background and want to or, or might not have any background. So do you want to give a a real overview of uh, a quick snapshot about what you do at Compass and then uh, and what the process looks like for someone who might be looking to buy. Right. Uh, I've been in this business for 14 years now. Um, I, I'm constantly sort of surprised at how this works because I think one of the things I learned in getting into this business is it's vastly different from the way it works in Australia. Um, I, I mean, I think that the most interesting difference, and we'll get into this, is, is the ability to be represented by a broker of your choosing. Uh, to engage with the broker representing either the, the landlord or the seller. Um, and I, I find, like, I just find that such a, a gift to people here that you're able to do that because, I mean, particularly when I'm working with first time home buyers, they have zero idea of how the, the, the process works. And they tend to be, you know, relying on my advice or, or you know, perhaps the advice of friends, which can be kind of frightening because then they end up cherry picking a lawyer from here and a lender from there and a broker. And, and I think the biggest uh, lesson I've got is having a team. So that's what I've got here. Um, I've worked with Jesse for the last six or seven years now and, and Keith uh, the last couple of years. 
Um, but I think without having a group of uh, people to coordinate and, and make this happen, it's, uh, it, it's quite a challenge. Yeah, um, I, I completely, I mean, that, that fundamental understanding of, uh, you know, I, I think that's one of the most important things we can start with is this idea of having representation and having whether you're, a, and I think a lot of people, again, would have been introduced to this as a renter where you've got a buyer, like you've got your own representative and then they've got a representative and there's a, a meeting of the minds. So do you want to explain just how that works from a, a renter and a buyer, go into a little bit of detail about how the fee structures work from a, a renter's a, or a buyer's agent and, and how, who's paying what? Yeah, well, the, the two very different things. Um, I think when you're working with a, a, a rental, it's a very dynamic market in New York. You can have, um, the market is very tight right now. So I think we've got a, about a one to one and a half percent vacancy rate. So one and a half out of every hundred apartments are available at any time. That's why you're seeing the lines of people around the block. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty cutthroat business. When the market is that tight, you'll find that uh, landlords are, uh, quite often would prefer the, the uh, tenant to pay the broker's fee. Um, and we in turn, uh, are looking for something between a month and well we're, we're looking for about a, a, a month of commission um for each of the parties involved um you you'll you'll notice though like when i started um there was a, it was in 2010 the market was sort of cratering there um you, you can find it at other times that uh, landlords will provide incentives and that's where you get the, like the no fee apartments or the collect your own fee or whatever it is but you, you're basically looking at a spectrum of no fee to one month or to close to two months um, fee on top of your first and last month um, of, of rent to just get your foot in the door of an apartment. And that's completely apart from jumping through all of the hoops of the application process. Um, you know, and there, there's a whole lot of paperwork. They do a you know, credit and background check. Because um, essentially, I think New York is one of those places where tenants, once they're in place, they're fairly well protected. It's really hard for landlords to get them out. Um, so they want to be sure that you're, a, a, you know, a credible uh, and good candidate to be, you know, staying in their property. Um, I think I think it's one one of those things as well. It's it's also a, a very relationship based game. So finding yourself a broker that understands the market and has you know roots in in a particular area knows the other brokers can can really benefit you a whole lot. And that that goes for for you know renting and buying. I think. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of that, when it comes to like listings and having that relationship with someone, is that basically because finding particular houses that are on the market to buy or apartments to buy, they will only be accessible to someone like yourself who's connected or is it, is it really just sort of giving you the advantage of quick access to it? What's the, how does that process work? Can, can be that as well. I mean, essentially you can do all these things yourself um, if you know what you're doing, but Look, you even find seasoned uh, or, or uh, you know, people that have bought multiple times still getting themselves into hot water because of things they hadn't considered. Um, and that's basically what I am. That's that's my job. And that's the job of the team to to spot the, you know, the uh, the booby traps along the way, you know, and navigate around them uh, or at least point them out. And, you know, sometimes you, you do run into uh, challenges, but at least if you're aware, I think there's there's uh, less of a. a you know, you, you're not going to panic as much because I think the other part of what uh, I do is is just expectation management, um, trying to help people understand how they get through this. Now, it's interesting. About two years ago, I had an Australian uh, couple, family, in fact, um, move to Brooklyn, and I can't I can't tell you how many times he had to question me. It's like, is this really how it works here? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. And, and at every step of the way, he's like. I, I can't believe it. I'm like, I know. I, it's just how it goes. And and like, you know, thankfully he, he trusted me along the way, but it was, it was a real uh, eye opener for me because I, I'm so used to it now, but like, it's so, I think it's so vastly different in Australia. Um, you know, you have your local real estate agency and they have a book of rentals and you go in, you say, I want to rent a place in this neighborhood. What have you got? And there's no fees because, you know, the landlord is paying the fee there. Um, it's all pretty streamlined here. It, 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 it can just go in so many different directions, depending on the economic circumstances, basically. Okay. So Keith, uh, from Guardhill financial, this is a Rob just perfectly mentioned financial. So it was a, a nice way to 
or economic to segue beautifully. Do you want to give a little bit of an introduction about what Guard Hill Financial does as a, a concept? Sure. And similarly to Rob, like from a 30,000 foot view, how is someone assessing financially, like what, who qualifies for a loan? What, what is the sort of, what, what are they feeling for? Sure. So first of all, Guard Hill and me, um, I've been doing this for 25 years. Guard Hill has been a mortgage bank for over 30 years in New York City, but we're licensed in a bunch of states around the country, including California, Texas, Florida, you know, Illinois, Massachusetts. Um, there are three ways or three sort of lenders, lender types that you could go to. One is you go to directly to the bank. You walk into Wells Fargo, whatever they have to offer you, that's what you get. If they can't in New York, especially when we're dealing with co-ops and condos, if they can't approve the building or they can't approve you, they might take a while to tell you this. Um, and then you're going to have to take all your documentation, go to someone else and figure it out. Um, and a lot of times the contract is dictating what amount of time you have and you could lose your apartment. You could lose, you know, your down payment. Uh, worst case, um, the second way to go place to sort of go to get a mortgage is a mortgage broker. We've probably all heard of mortgage brokers. The mortgage broker uh, is where you take all your documentation, you give it to a mortgage broker, they vet you, they, again, dealing with co-ops and condos specifically in New York, they vet the co-op condo, they try to figure out which of their multitude of banks they can go to to get you approved and get the building approved. The problem with mortgage brokers, I was a mortgage broker a long time ago, problem with mortgage brokers after 2008, most lenders do not work with mortgage brokers, 2008 being the credit crisis. Um, justly or unjustly, mortgage brokers were blamed. Uh, you can no longer go to Wells, Chase, City, Bank of America, Santander, HSBC, you name it, mortgage brokers do not have access to those banks. What we are, Gardner Financial, we're a mortgage bank, so we're a banker. In other words, we do what the big banks do. We don't look for deposits at all, though. We, are, we don't keep any of the loans on our books. What that means, basically, is that we underwrite, we approve, we close, and we fund the loans with our credit lines, our money. And then we look to sell the loan or transfer it to one of a number of our investors, just like the big banks do. They transfer to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or a multitude of private investors. Um, our investors range, though, from the Chase, Wells, and Cities of the world. They will work with us. So we do have the, the multinationals that we work with, but we also have regional lenders, local regional lenders around the New York area, also California, Florida, you know, you name it. We have regional lenders, which we can pretty much use anywhere we want in the country. So it gives us, we do the shopping for you. We know where we're going to get you approved and where we're going to get that building approved. And if we're not sure, then we we obviously have to vet it. Um, most buildings we have to vet. We vet you, um, and we figure out you know the best. Again, where can we get you approved? Where can we get the building approved? And out of that pool of banks, who's got the best rate, loan program, et cetera, for you? Um, your next thing was about qualifying and all that. Kind yeah. Of stuff. So uh, the, you sort of started to mention on like this idea of we assess you, we assess the place. Yeah. 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 Like, so so the the. It's hard because every person is different. Years ago, it was pretty straightforward. You know, that's why probably the world almost, the financial world almost collapsed because everybody was getting mortgages. Now it's basically the, the four basic things that banks look at are income assets, credit, and debt. Let's put aside the building, the, you know, the property type, the loan amount, the purchase price, income assets, credit, debt. So when you're thinking about what do I need to provide or what should I really think about? You need to think about or, or put together your tax returns, your bank statements, your, your um, uh, you know, what debts do you have on a monthly basis? Um, and how's your credit? I'll take it right to credit now, if, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Just by saying credit for, you know, anybody coming, whether it's Australia or anywhere, is the biggest thing that or the biggest hurdle that you're going to sort of have to jump over to get yourself in a position to be able to get qualified for a mortgage. Um, Cause you know, people say, say, well, I've credit over there. It doesn't matter. The US, we don't care here. They don't care. Um, typically, you know, so if you're here for a couple of years or you just got here and you're thinking about, it, you want to buy a place. And again, I'm not a rental expert, so I don't know these specifics on the credit for rental, but 
you want to go out and get yourselves any and all bank cards, department store cards, gas station cards, whatever, um, as early as you can in the process, as early as you can, you're, you know, that you're here so that you can start building your credit. You want to be able to have that credit and use that credit. Banks want to see that you're able to use your credit. The credit system that's trying to sort of figure out what your score is, again, it's a, you know, a whole computer program, sure. will look at how much you have, how many trade lines you have, how much available credit you have, and how, you ma how much you use that credit, and how do you manage that credit? Meaning, do you make your payments on time? Um, okay. And that's the best advice I can give anybody up front is just to sort of come here, start get, building your credit. Yeah, so, I, and I think that is a contrast, like Rob was saying, there, there's a contrast between Australia and the US where credit is seen, you know, using your credit is almost seen as a negative, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, it, sorry. Oh my God, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, yeah. I, I remember when I got my first credit card here, and I was, I got a, you know, I was working overseas, and I had a, I don't know, $15,000 credit limit, I moved here, and I get a $500 credit limit, so <laughs> I went straight onto the website and was punching this button, like, increase credit limit. And then now that I'm in this business, I find that that's the very sort of behavior that lowers your credit scores. Like, how, how do we get ahead here? Um, and, and this is one of the things that I really wanted to let people know about the system here. There's ways to game it a little bit and, and use it to your advantage. Um, yeah. Yeah. So as Keith was saying, you know, it's diverse ranges of credit lines, making sure that you've got as many options as you can, paying them off on time or uh, like as soon as, never incur you don't want to be getting bad debt, but you want all the debt or you're sorry, you want all the credit capacity, basically. Yeah, it's funny because people will say, I'll say that one of the main questions I ask in my, in the first 10 minutes I'm speaking to somebody is how is your credit? And an answer that I get often is I have no debt. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask you that. I asked you how your credit was, you know, it's how you manage your debt, you know, and do you have enough credit, you know, car loans and leases, student loans, mortgages, obviously will really build your credit nicely. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's why we're all here. So in terms of what you would come, so you've got a credit score. So a lot of the people watching when they arrive, and this is completely normal for everyone watching, you will start with absolutely no credit score. You won't be able to find it. Credit Karma and all those apps won't show a number because you just don't have a history. It normally takes a few months. So Keith, from your perspective, until somebody actually shows up in a, on one of the apps, basically, is there any point in coming to you or, or a financial institution, or is it really just going to be much too difficult without any form of presence? I, um, so, you know, they, somebody that doesn't, gen, it doesn't take a lot to generate a credit score. So you can literally have one, I call them trade lines, like a, you know, your Amex is a trade line, your car loan is a trade line, your mortgage is a trade line. Yeah. Um, you can have one or two trade lines and actually generate three credit scores. We require three credit scores. There are three different credit repositories in the US. You may have heard of an Equifax TransUnion and Experian. So you may generate a credit score and depending upon the loan size, the lender, the property type, all that kind of stuff, you may not need more than one or two uh, trade lines. However, banks, even though you generate credit scores, you may unfortunately need, some banks require the minimum is four trade lines, open and active trade lines. So. <laughs> What do, my, my point is this, if you, if you, I would credit karma, people come to me and say, my score is 780. And then I run their score and it's 720, you know, the middle score. It, it's, that's not really a deep dive. You know, it's not sure, going to sure. give you what you want. So my thought process is if, yeah, if you're uncertain, if you're not generating a credit score, just call me anywhere, call somebody anyway, and, you know, have them run your credit or have a discussion with them and say, no, I really don't. I just got my first credit card last month. And I'll be like, you know what? Try to get more, call me back in six months. Maybe we'll run your credit back. I think, I think um, it, um, the other thing I'm finding uh, a lot is that people aren't possibly aren't aware that they can transfer their credit history from Australia, depending on who, who they bank with or whether it's like American Express or whatever else. It, it's worth investigating that uh, as you plan your move over here. Like, is your bank able to assist you with that? Because that could give you a really good running start. Um, yeah, I think it's important to, um, and this is a, a good sort of differentiation. There is There are mechanisms available to get, <clears throat> pardon me, and Amex is a good example. Amex have a way to access your foreign credit. That will get you a credit card. So as Keith was saying, that will set up your first line. 
So that will be your, your way in. It won't necessarily give you, or it won't give you a credit score at one of the three credit bureaus. It won't immediately equate to that, but it will get you on the books here. And then you can start the, and as I'm sure a lot of people watching have, have tried, once you've got one, you'll start to get letters in the mail saying like, you can have 12 more, like watch this. Once you've got the one, once you appear on the books yeah. for each of those three credit bureaus, the, the momentum will start at the beginning. It sucks and you should get a secured credit card as Keith was saying, any type of line of credit that does not cost you any money and doesn't sort of, you know, it's not a person at the, the back of the service station, <laughs> the gas station, it's any other form is going to be worth it. And then that, that will can start that rolling. Yeah. And I, I should have mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the rentals as well. Is, uh, one of the issues is that if you're a foreigner and you come here with no credit history and they can't do a credit and background check, you, the next step is to, an, is to look for a guarantor of some kind. And that can be a friend, a relative, someone. Generally in New York, they like the tri-state area. But failing that, because if you're moving here from Australia, you probably don't have like a close friend that's willing to you know, sign their life away for, for you, know, you defaulting your rent. Um, you need to go and find a guarantor, and then that's another fee that's added on to your, you know, your, your uh, you know, foot in the door sort of costs of moving in. Um, it can get really, really expensive, uh, even just for rentals. We're, we're talking like, you know, at least four, if not five or six months rent just to, you know, sign the lease and and get in there. And that's that's a that's a fair bit of money. It is. Keith, from, a, um, from your perspective for buying, is there a way to do that sort of guarantor or is it, do people co-sign or not, not a thing? If you're on, if you're so on the the, the, if you don't have credit, so anybody that goes on the loan application needs to have credit. So it, you can't go on the loan application with no credit scores and have a guarantor with three credit scores. Um, you know, the guarantor from the mortgage world is more meant for income to help you with income and assets and things like that yeah. but credit the bank will look at just and taking this back a step you said what if they you know what should they get credit first or not well if they're if they find a property and it's imminent that they need to buy it but they haven't really built up their credit yet we still can do it as if they were a foreign buyer it's going to cost them more they're not they're going to have to put down more but if there's something that they can't pass up on and they've been here and established at least they're their employment here and income, we can still help them, you know, get a mortgage. It just may not be at favorable terms. They take it and then hopefully refinance down the road. Okay. And we will definitely be touching on refinancing because that is one that uh, I think has, has come up a lot. Jesse, I want to make sure I give you an opportunity because you've been very patient yeah. and sitting there very, very, very <laughs> kindly. Right. Je Jesse going from HH and K attorneys. Do you want to give a, a quick bit of background about yourself and HH and K and then also from what we've just been talking about with this idea of, you know, being as Keith was just touching on, there are mechanisms available for people who aren't US citizens. Do you want to talk about a little bit about, again, this 30,000 foot view of what it looks like for someone going through the process of buying a place and, and following compliance if you are not a citizen? Sure. Uh, yeah, in terms of myself, I think Rob mentioned he's been working since 2010 in this industry, and I have as well. I uh, graduated law school in 2010, so been doing this about 14 years. Uh, him and Howard and Cattell has been around for about 100 years. Uh, old firm, about 100 attorneys, uh, but mostly based in upstate New York. So in New York City, it's, it's me, a couple other attorneys um, in the White Plains office. Um, in terms of your immigration status for buying in New York City, uh, no, I mean, really, there aren't any hurdles other than all the lending hurdles, which I think are the primary concerns um, of, of international buyers. Um, no, there, there shouldn't be any obstacle to buying an apartment or a house um, in New York. There's no sort of um, check to make sure that you're either a U.S. citizen or a U.S. taxpayer. But um, there are issues to be aware of, and I know we're not going to get too deep into taxes here, and I don't have the uh, expertise to get into uh, issues, but it's something that's something that you should look into. And, and at least I can have a brief discussion with um, people coming yeah. in because it, there are significant um, issues on the way out. When you're selling a, a, a property in New York, if you're really in the US, um, but also in New York, if you're not a US taxpayer, which is a complicated question, but at least if you don't have a social security number, uh, you are going to have significant hurdles, not that you can't do it, um, but in terms of selling, it's gonna, there's gonna be hurdles that you have to um, overcome that you wouldn't if you were a US taxpayer. 
Okay, so yeah, there's considerations certainly on the tax side um, and mm -hmm. that idea of exiting is going to be where it really starts to come into play. In terms of right. the uh, asking the question, they is it am I right in saying that banks are not even legally allowed to ask you about your citizenship? Is that right? Like they're not allowed to, because they, they can't be a discriminatory reason that they don't lend to you? They right. absolutely will ask. They'll absolutely ask you about your citizenship. That's the main thing. Yeah, for sure. I don't think that's right. discriminatory. One of the oh uh, yeah, I, I I may be wrong. I I thought there was some protection around. They I know for for example, uh, um, well sorry, my understanding was from a uh, leasing perspective because that's the only thing I've done. I, like if you mm -hmm. apply for a, a tenancy, they can't ask you your your citizenship status. So you can't be asked your immigration status at that point. But in the financials perspective, I guess they want yeah. much more of a. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt. Uh, you. Okay. I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't do all that much on the. Um, you know, other than negotiating lease terms, um, I don't do all that much on the um, leasing side of citizenship and things like that. But I, I don't. I think you're probably right um, that I don't think landlords can um, ask your immigration status and then say yes or no to you um, as a tenant. But I don't think that's uh, well, what Keith I think is saying is that it's, it's not necessarily true on the financing yep. side of things. No, cool. Rob, from a to sort of zoom back out because I think there's a, a really sort of good you were, you were touching on this idea of like the overall differences. I want to talk about like what are if we go from and Keith, you can jump in as well. In terms of the overall process from start to finish, what kind of costs, Rob, are involved in like going through the process for buying a place? What what would someone from Australia be, you know, if they've come in, they want to buy a place, what does it look like? Good question. Um I mean, are you, are you talking about closing costs, I guess, in, in, in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I, if you've come in, you're watching this webinar, you don't know. So it's sort of the, what am I, what am I, who am I going to be paying? What are they going to be doing? And, and by the end of it, what's it going to, to look right. like? Right. Well, I mean, let's start with the agent. So if you want to work with an agent like myself, um, the, the, the broker fee is generally in New York, it's, um, it's generally paid by the seller. So the seller will agree to pay a, something between sort of four to six percent, and that's in New York City. That's split between the listing agent and the buyer's agent. So there's there's no cost to you there. One thing that has happened recently is there's a big settlement um, with the National Association of Realtors. Um, there's a big lawsuit. Uh, they talk about price fixing, whatever else. So as of uh, August 17, uh, in a few days, um, there's going to be a bit of new paperwork. Um, that involves uh, agreeing to work with a buyer's agent. And part of that is that you agree that um, you'll pay the broker a certain amount of a fee if the seller is not paying that fee. And there's always ways of massaging that. And I think ideally you would have it baked into the, the, the cost of buying a home. Um, so that's not something you should necessarily worry about. And if your broker it, it can't explain that to you, um, yeah, I mean, that's on them, but it, it's, it's not, a, it's not, it's confusing. I think when you come from Australia where you don't have representation, um, but again, I think it's, it's one of the benefits of this system moving down the track. I mean, basically I, as a broker, I work for commission only, so there's, there's no cost to me working with you. It's a, basically a success fee when, once you close, um, but. As you get to the closing table, I think Jesse and Keith will be able to tell you more about the closing costs. There's, there's a yep. there's a pretty broad spectrum of, of of what they be. Yeah. If you were to look at uh, a co-op, which is I guess the same company title back home in Australia, mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a it's a corporate entity where you own shares and you get to live in a portion of the building. Um, I think correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but I think you're, you're looking at a couple of thousand dollars to close on any co-op. Yeah, I mean, you know, it can vary greatly, and, and and there's so many different variables that it's it's hard for us to give a, you know, a figure to say it's you know. No, no, you're not a number. Yeah, 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 yeah. But let's say you're buying a co-op, um, and you happen to uh, be able to buy it all cash. Sorry, you think you buy it all cash, and it's uh, less than a million dollars. You know, you could keep your closing costs, paying an attorney, so my firm, and the co-op some application fees. You can keep your costs to. I don't know, you know, 10 grand or so, just as a rough, rough, rough number um, on a less than a million dollar place, all cash. Once you go above a million dollars in New York State, not just New York City, uh, you pay what's called a mansion tax, even for apartments in New York that are perhaps a thousand. Yeah. Far from mansions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. They'll charge what they call a mansion tax, 
um, for anything over a million dollars. And not just, and the moment you go over a million dollars, it's a 1% um, tax based on the purchase price and it grades up. So if it's over two, it goes higher than that. If it's over three and over five, it goes higher and higher. Um, yep. You're borrowing money if you're taking, Keith can speak a little more maybe to this, but once you're borrowing money, there are taxes, uh, tax, there are fees associated with uh, your mortgage, taxes. both, both on, right, both on the bank side but also on New York City side, if you're buying a condo or a house as opposed to a co-op, uh, you pay a mortgage tax simply based on the amount of the mortgage that you're uh, taking out. So these these numbers can vary greatly. You know, closing costs can go up to, you know, five, six, seven if you're buying from a sponsor or a developer. Seven percent of the purchase price is possible. Um, they can get pretty high, um, but they can also be much lower. And I think it's it's worth having a you know specific. Um, conversation with uh, a buyer. I always ask them up front, what are you looking at? Uh, what type of property? What's the price range? And as soon as they identify a property um, and a mortgage amount, I send uh, clients of mine or prospective clients even a really detailed uh, breakdown of what closing costs will look like. Yeah, perfect. And Keith, that's a perfect segue to you. So in terms yeah. of the costs and the process involved. Yeah, I mean, from a mortgage side of things, get, let's just think about whatever it is mortgage related closing costs you're in the five to six thousand dollar range and that includes appraisals underwriting fees application fees it depends on the state new york you need to actually an attorney to represent the bank as well um an independent counsel that's another you know new york is just the most expensive place by the way new jersey <laughs> connecticut i think california has mansion tax too that other one percent over a million dollars you know i know it's new york and new jersey connecticut um but then you're also dealing, like Jesse said, you have mortgage recording tax. Mortgage recording tax of, for loan amounts 500,000 and above is 1.925% of the loan amount. So if you're borrowing a million bucks, you're, you're 19,000 and change right there. If you're, you know, and if your purchase price is 2 million, then you're, you know, whatever, it's another, I think that's one and a quarter percent or something like that of the 2 million for the mansion tax. So right there, you're at, you know, 25 grand or whatever it is. So that's already 45,000. And then there's title insurance. Title insurance is something your attorney would handle for you. That's also depends on the purchase price and the loan amount. So 2 million, I don't know, Jesse, you could speak for this, maybe 10 grand for a million dollar, you know, something well, like that. Um, well, yeah. Right. And then, it, and I mean, literally you're, you're, and then your attorney and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, but again, the beautiful thing about the co-op the one nice thing about the co-op is the closing costs. Co-op closing costs are significantly lower than you know anything else, condo, one to four family home. Um, and our fee typically is paid by the bank, typically at the closing. There are instances, we do a lot of funky type of lending, um, traditional lending too, but we do a lot of different kinds of lending where sometimes the, the bank doesn't wanna pay us um, or doesn't pay us, but I would say that that's, 5% of the time um, where we, so there's really, to be honest, no real fee for the most part to use somebody like myself or to use me. I shouldn't say somebody like myself. I don't know what others do. Yeah, cool. And in terms of the, I know one of the things that um, we've got a few questions about property tax, which I realize is something that's an ongoing, do you, Keith, do you just want to sort of summarize what that looks like for someone who might be buying a place? And I, sure. I think emphasizing the differences, this is where we really want to highlight that the difference between cities and states and, and how much of a, like how unique it is. You've touched on this before, I know already, but. So again, when we're dealing with co-op, condo, or, you know, freestanding home, one to four family, um, we'll start with co-op because it's pretty much straightforward. You have your mortgage payment, but then you have what's called maintenance. Maintenance includes, because you're not buying real property, maintenance includes whatever property taxes the co-op is paying and their insurance, the replacement coverage insurance. So if the place burns down, it's covered by that insurance. Jesse could probably even speak a little bit more to this as well. Condo separates it a little bit because condo's real property, so you have to pay real property tax. Um, how much is it? Depends on the property, where it is. Brooklyn's a little cheaper. Manhattan's quite expensive. You know, and what year is built? And what year, right, is it, is it new construction, old, you know, is it post-war, pre-war, you know, all that kind of stuff, right, right. Um, and, but you have, so you, but then you'll also, with the property tax, you'll have separate maintenance or what they call common charges on a condo, or really, it's all homeowners association dues, which also includes the insurance. 
Separately for both condos and co-ops, you usually need a small little insurance policy that's going to cover the contents of your apartment. They call it walls in. And then for anything else, a one to four family home, which again, I keep saying one to four family because anything above four family is considered commercial. Um, but one to four family homes, you just have your property tax and homeowners insurance that you're going to pay. Um, you know, you get your own homeowners insurance separately. Did I miss okay. anything, Jess? No, I mean, I think the, the, the property taxes in New York um, vary just so greatly. And, and you could find a place that looks exactly the same, but was built, um, but was turned into a condo two years ago. So they got this crazy tax abatement. Uh, you could find taxes that are extremely low for 10 years through some government program. Um, and then it jumps up, you know, greatly over the next 10 years. But yeah, taxes vary greatly. It's the kind of thing where I know I'll probably say this a bunch over the course of the evening, but um, it's worth just just reaching when, once you identify a property um, and you see it's advertised as having X taxes. That's part of the conversation I have with clients is to say, yeah, yeah it's X today, but it looks like it might go up uh, over the next five years. And I have to say, for me, the, the, those common charges or the maintenance and the taxes all combined, it's, it's one of the, the most important numbers, I think, when you're looking into this, because part of the component, I think, with Keith is when he's you know, processing a loan is this is how much we can lend you based on your down payment. But if you're telling me that uh, you've got two similar properties and one is is like three thousand dollars a month in in combined charges and the other one's one thousand dollars a month, that, that makes a huge difference to how much they're, they're able to lend you. Um, and it makes a huge difference to, to your monthly budget because uh, I mean, that's a lot of Starbucks coffees that you're going to have to give up if you're, if you're paying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what, on that note, what goes in, I should have said this earlier, but what goes into qualifying you for the mortgage is, you know, your whatever the potential mortgage payment is, plus those carrying costs that Rob is mentioning, you know, the taxes, common charges, or the maintenance, whatever it is, whatever kind of property you're buying, plus any other consumer debt that you have. So student loans, car loans, credit card debt, car leases, things, mortgages, any other properties you might own, whether here or overseas. Um, and then they divide that by your total gross monthly income. And that's, there's different calculations, whether you're salaried or self-employed, how they look at it, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a maximum allowable debt to income ratio. Um, and depending upon the loan program, I should say the property type, uh, how much you're borrowing, what the purchase price is, um, the occupancy, is it a primary residence, a second home or an investment property will sort of determine what that max allowable debt to income ratio is yeah it's also worth mentioning at that point that while the lender might have a, a maximum debt to income ratio if you're looking at a co-op quite often they have a very specific debt to income ratio um, which as you go through the process of doing your co-op application which is another experience in itself um, <laughs> you, you definitely want to make sure you adhere to that because it, it'd be be very disappointing if you get through the whole process of, uh, you know, making a bid, having the offer accepted, doing an application and finding out that you're a couple of percentage points over what they're looking for and you get rejected. Nothing so worse. You'll never find that in a, in a condo uh, and you'll never find that in a townhouse situation. Jesse, do you want to touch on that? Because it's a good segue into just this idea of like, what is involved with a co-op? Like, what are, what are the yeah. prices? What is this? What is this packet we're putting together? What are, What's the interview process like? What's the... So, so the co-op is this, you know, somewhat unique beast. I think they have similar things throughout the country, but I don't know if anywhere is exactly the same as New York. Uh, the, the, yes, the ownership type is different, but day to day, you know, you walk into your co-op, like you walk into your condo, you open the front door, you turn the key, it's your uh, place to live. So you know, that part, yes, there are differences and we can talk about them. Um, but that's not, I don't think what's worth focusing on in terms of the application process. The important thing to note is that in a co-op, this, corporation which, which runs this building can simply say yes or no to you as an applicant for basically any reason they want other than sex, age, you know, some of these protected classes. Um, and the, the really tricky part about it is if they say no to you, they don't have to say why they said no to you. So yeah. even if they have a reason that you, you know, suspect may be uh, not okay, um, it's almost impossible to prove that. So you go into the process knowing that for the most part, uh, the co-op might just say no to me and they don't have to explain why. Um, I might you know, make a million dollars a year and I can easily afford the maintenance, the monthly charges, um, and they could say no. Typically, a condo doesn't have that right. A condo has certain rights 
um, in terms of an application. They likely will require you to um, submit an application, but they don't have the right to just say yes or no. And that's what separates condos from co-ops and what makes uh, the co-op this, you know, sort of unique um, thing where you're 90% you're of the way there and all of a sudden it is possible, unlikely, unusual still, but yes. possible that uh, at the last minute, you're not going to be able to buy the apartment that the seller wanted to sell to you and the buyer wanted to buy, the price was agreed upon, and the deal dies. Um, that's that's in, in terms of you know the, the easiest way to um, and the most practical difference between co-ops and condos is that single family homes there's no governing body saying yes or no um, it's can you qualify for a mortgage and can we close do you, do you have to sell a fair title um, co-ops have this extra uh, layer in that they can say yes or no to you for almost any reason so Jesse is that something that you're like if I'm someone that wants to go into a co-op and Rob, I'll come to you afterwards, but if I'm someone that wants to go into a co-op, is that something that you prepare? Like, is it, is it about the packet that you put together in the presentation or is it just sometime like, I, I understand they won't tell you, but like from your experience, is it, is it generally like if you come in fully prepared that serves you better than someone else or? Generally, well, yes. I mean, if you come in fully prepared, it serves you better on it for a number of reasons. And I think Rob can touch on this a bit, but yeah. a, a bit qualified buyer who, who good brokers are quite sure um, will get approved by a board are more likely to get their offer accepted than a not as good of a qualified buyer. So, you know, buyer number one who has a, you know, a W-2 job and makes $500,000 a year is more likely to get approved by a board than your graphic designer who has unsteady income and that sort of thing. And not always the case, but a, a broker may, a, a listing they say, hey, your offer came in at the exact same amount, um, but I'm going with the guy who I think is going to get um, approved, more likely to get approved by the board. Um, yeah. Bob and you know, at the broker stage, both before the offer, I think a good broker is telling you, like Rob is going to tell you, um, I think this is a building where you know you have a better likelihood of getting approved in than this other building. This building allows parents to buy for kids. Not all buildings allow parents to buy for kids. I'm not as involved in that stage of the process. Sure. So once you have an accepted offer, I one of the major things that I do is do due diligence into these co-ops or condos. And on the co-op side, yeah, I'm looking into what their um, policies are in terms of applications. And I'm having that discussion with, with clients um, to say, hey, I, I think you're buying this as a pied a terre or as an apartment for you know your child, and that you're not going to live in as a primary residence. Uh, I'm looking at this this uh, you know, policy that the co-op has, and I don't know that this is going to be the right fit. Yeah, right. So it really is this, and Rob, this I, I guess is one of the fundamental things for you. When somebody comes to you and they say, <clears throat> I want to buy a place, you've got to have that knowledge of like, hey, as much as yes, as Jesse was saying, on paper you've got the money, you know, you'd be able to service the loan. Or, or not loan or even, but like it might still have a whole bunch of complications down the road. So what what is the process when somebody comes to you, how do you sort of frame out? Is it a discussion? Is it about motivation? Is it about money? Is it like what's sort of first for you? It's at least a half an hour to an hour conversation. Um, it, it is partly about the motivation. I think that my first question is what brings you or what's brought you to this point? Like what's changed sure. in your life? And, and we talk about it in real estate as, uh, quite often. It's like birth, death, and marriages. Um, you know, these yep. big life changes. <laughs> or you or you moving country. Um, I guess the next thing is, um, I've, I'm, I think in New York with just the cost of living, the cost of schooling. Um, I think one of my earliest questions would be, how many kids do you have, and where are you sending them to school? Yeah. Um, that's going to dictate what school district or or school zone you want to be in, in particular. Um, where I live in Brooklyn, I'm in District 15. It's it's it encompasses Park Slope to Carroll Gardens and and uh, Cobble Hill, uh, Red Hook. Um, there's some great schools in there, and people target those areas because while it might be more expensive to buy a home in a good school zone, you're almost you can think of it as as, as putting the school fees through, through like on the mortgage, like uh, yeah, from, from what I'm understanding. That yeah, I mean, school fees these days are anything from sort of thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year per kid, and uh, like that's a it's a huge amount of money to be making, uh, you know, after tax. Um, if you can somehow incorporate that into that, the mortgage, is great. The other thing I like to talk to people about is what's your exit strategy. It's one thing to buy the place, but where are you going after this, and and how long is that going to take? Because I think the the big thing to consider 
I mean, real estate is a great investment vehicle, uh, especially in places like New York. Um, and you can debate whether it's an investment vehicle or, or, or it's, you know, something else. But um, generally speaking, I think whether you're in Sydney, London, New York, any of those big cities, property values tend to double every seven to 10 years, barring any other economic catastrophe. Um, but you really only start to break even after about sort of four or five years. So you need to be committed to living there for at least four or five years or more. And the longer you stay there, um, the better off you're going to be when you go to trade into the next one. But I think I think the, the big part for me is really teasing out the motivations, the details, what it is you're looking for and what your lifestyle is. Um, I, like I... I, I very much approach it from a lifestyle perspective. Like, do you want to be near a park? Is a restaurant and cafe is important to you? Um, do you want to be right on the subway or can you walk 10 minutes? There's different things that that um, that will affect the price. And it's just worth taking those into consideration. Um, and, and it's, I think it's, for me, it's about putting together a matrix of, of these concepts that um, we can sort of bring together. And what I do like to do is some, sometimes people are set on a certain area or type of place or a neighborhood. And it, it's it's nice to be able to introduce them to a different part of the city that they have never heard of, wouldn't have considered, and then they just find that it's the perfect spot. Um, that, that's, that's, that's part of what I really enjoy about um, working with buyers, just, you know, seeing them walk into the place. And, and you can, you know, I think we, we say buyers generally make a decision within the first couple of minutes. Like you can walk in and be like, yep, this is the one. Yep. So it's, it's great to see that on their faces. Yeah. I love it. So how much, inf like, obviously there is, we've talked with both Keith and Jesse about this idea of how diverse each city and state is when it comes to how much knowledge somebody should have. So if you've moved here and you have, you've basically like, you know, I need, I want to buy a house. I've, I've got my motivations lined up. You know, I've got a family and I want somewhere stable. We're going to be here for 10 years. How much research or how much knowledge do you expect people to have of, you know, the locations or is it more just knowing your own story and sort of presenting? Zero. It? Yeah, zero. They can come in with absolutely no idea. Um, it, it's, it, it really just depends how much, how much time they're willing to spend on the conversation and, and letting me learn more about what it is they like. I think the next part of it is like once we get to that basic stage of right, okay, we've got a budget, we've got a basic idea, let's go out together. Um, and at least for the first couple of uh, weekends out, particularly at open houses, and that's the best way to see things in New York. Sundays are open house for um, sales. Saturdays, you can have open houses for rentals. But, um, you know, I dedicate my Sundays to going out with buyers if I'm not working with a seller. Um, and, and that experience, just walking the streets with you, um, you know, getting in the door, looking at the apartments, you know, seeing what it is that, that you know, you like and you don't like, it, it just makes me, it, you know, it turns the gears in my head. And it's like, okay, what are the alternatives? Where can we go from here? Um, because it's, it is, it is, it is a, look, it's a challenging process and it can be overwhelming. Uh, I think there's a lot of emotions involved in it. Um, it's, it's, I think it's all like a, a part of it is just managing, as I said, your expectations, uh, and keeping you on a, on level because I think um, I don't know I've, I've seen some things get get kind of heated and you've got to remind people like what what the aim of, of this is. Um, yeah, you're looking for a home for your family. Let's stay on course. <laughs> no, I get it. In terms of like where the market is right now, Rob, what's the like how much power does a buyer have to you know negotiate and how much strategy is going into the or is it really like you know you have to check all the boxes and hope for the best what's and I realize it's again going to be a, a very individual thing but sort of as, as your overarching feel it's a real market specific thing like neighborhoods can be very different but but yeah. by and large I think I just heard recently that that the Manhattan has become a buyer's market I don't necessarily agree with that <laughs> it's, it's, like <laughs> no, I don't think so. no I'm waiting where are they <laughs> yeah and so so I mean we've we've had you know since 2010 or whatever we've had you know 12 years of incredibly low interest rates and then uh, they rapidly ramped up in 2022. And, and we've, we've had, um, I mean, I think another one of the fascinating things about the US market is we have a 30 year fixed mortgage. No, I don't know anywhere else, and certainly not in Australia, can you get a mortgage where you know how much your payments are going to be for the next 30 years? So I think the statistic was something like 60% of mortgages across the country are at 4% or lower interest rates. So we're, we're in a situation now where there's a hell of a lot of owners out there that have insufficient motivation to sell and that's that's meant we've had low inventory 
combined with high um, you know, interest rates, like they've, they've put some pressure on things, but the low inventory has kept prices fairly stable. Um, it's kind of fascinating. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, they're talking about rates dropping in um, September to maybe five, five and a quarter. I don't know. The market buzz is that the floodgate's going to open and you know everyone's going to start buying and selling again. We'll, we'll see about that. Um, but it, it seems to be fairly balanced. Um, days on market are going up lately. Um, inventory is, is seeming to increase. Um, I think that the, the discount um, or like the, the, the discount is sort of increasing. I think sellers are still trying to figure out what realistic pricing is because no one wants to sit on the market forever. Um, but you do want to, you know, you want to attract the, the, the right buyer at the right price. Yeah. 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 Keith, I, just to touch on what Rob was just saying about the 30 year, because I, I know that is something that for Australians, that is something that feels very foreign. Um, do you just want to, so is yeah. that the, is that what most people are dealing Go. <laughs> so, yeah. So 30 year fixed, it, it's, I'm struggling with people right now because 30 year fixed is going to be your most conservative, but also your most expensive uh, and highest rate typically um, when you take out a mortgage. The, the, you know, they're also shorter fixed rate mortgages, like a 20 year fixed or a 15 year fixed, similar concept there. Your, your payment's not going to change. However, for the 20 or the 15, your payments are going to be higher because you're paying it off quicker. Your interest is going to be lower, but you're paying it off sooner. Um, when interest rates are low, 30 year fixed, why would you take anything else? Why put any risk into your life as far as your, you know, your monthly output as far as expenses? But when interest rates are high and there's the talk of interest rates coming down, there's honestly, unless there's not much of a difference or, you know, it depends on where the loan amount is and what the monthly payment is. There's no reason to take a 30 year fix. So what we have also in this country, I don't know exactly how it is in Australia. I've heard about some other countries where it's kind of variable, you know, constantly variable, but there are adjustable rate mortgages or arms they're called. And the adjustable rate mortgage is not as scary as it sounds. It basically means the rate is going to be fixed for let's say five, seven or 10 years. So you have zero risk for five, seven, or 10 years. The payment is amortized over a 30 year period. So it's still a 30 year mortgage, but after let's say seven years, the rate could adjust either on an annual basis or a semi-annual basis. So yeah, there's risk, but if the rates are coming down and you're, you can get a 30 year fixed at you know, seven and a half or a seven year adjustable at six and a half and you can save $400 a month, why would you spend the extra money over that amount of time? Most mortgages, actuarial tables show that most mortgages are going to be paid off whether you sell your property or refinance within seven years. Yeah. So I once spoke, I've, I've, owned a bunch, I've owned a few properties, I've refinanced several times, never have done a fixed rate mortgage. Now, again, even when the rates were really low, I refinanced my house. Um, but I went into an adjustable because I knew that I took a 10 year adjustable. I knew that I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be in this house after 10 years. Like I got kid, you know, some older kids were heading to college, blah, 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 blah. I still don't want to spend as, that much on a monthly basis. You know, and again, it depends on is your loan amount one and a half million or is it 500,000? Now one and a half, you might want to consider the adjustable because it's a big payment. 500,000, maybe not. You want to just be a little bit more conservative. Um, so that's kind of, you know, <laughs> Be, you'll read or I tell people don't read anything speak try <laughs> to speak to somebody that has knowledge that you feel comfortable with you know that has experience self personal experience but also experience you know as as you know their employment their job uh, their career um because you I mean the, the news just doesn't it, the, people don't report correctly but in any case yes there are there are options here yeah uh, cool. multiple options yeah. and in terms of refinancing and and going down that path that is, so if you've you've taken on a, a mortgage, what is the process involved in, in the US sort of broadly about that? So a refinance is basically, you don't need an attorney. Sorry, Jess. You don't need an attorney. You're not dealing with a real estate agent. Um, you, you know, you're just dealing with somebody like myself. Um, and basically it's a lot more streamlined. If it is a co-op, you're still gonna have to get through a co-op board, but it's a much different process. You're not meeting them. You probably just make, you know, and if you've been there for a bunch of years already and they know you make your payments, it's really just a sign off, but you do have to hand in a package and get it signed off, but it's a streamlined package. Um, 
For refinancing, they're, they're, first of all, most loans, most mortgages in this country now do not have prepayment penalties. So you can refinance literally six months after you buy. Um, I'm talking to people now, rates have come down a little bit. I'm talking to people now that have bought beginning of the year and we're starting to consider, does it make wow. sense now? Do we wanna wait? You know, what's the difference? Um, the way, you know, and there's no hard and fast number, like it has to come down a full percent for it to make sense. Uh-uh, because it's all based on closing costs. So if you can save X amount of dollars per month, $500 a month, and it's gonna cost you $10,000 to do it, well, your break even is 20 months. So if you, you feel you're gonna have this new mortgage within 20 months, you're gonna recoup the cost yep. for the refinance. Also, we heard about these exorbitant fees on condos and one to four family homes and the mansion tax and all that. Mansion tax only applies on purchases. Mortgage tax, condos, obviously not co-ops, but condos, one to four family homes. We have a way to avoid that. Most lenders will allow you to do something. It's called a consolidation extension modification agreement, where essentially without getting into heavy detail, it's a way to avoid that 1.925% mortgage tax. So instead of paying 20 grand on a million dollar loan, you'll maybe pay 1500 bucks to your existing lender to help you with this, uh, what's called a SEMA. Title insurance also, you get a redu reduced fee usually if you're doing it within 10 years of taking out the initial mortgage. So when it comes to refinancing, literally all I'm doing is calculating. Here's what you're saving, here's what it's gonna cost, there may be also ways that we can save you some money, credit you back some of the closing costs. There's a lot of different things that you can do on a refinance that sometimes just aren't available on a purchase. Um, and the good thing about a refinance also is usually on a purchase, we probably should have talked about this a little bit, but usually on a purchase, you apply for the mortgage. If it's a co-op, you really can't lock in the interest rate. So you're subject to market fluctuation because interest rates can only be locked. They're, they're period certain. So you can't lock them just forever until you close. And sometimes a co-op could take 90, maybe even more, 90 days, 120 days to close. So you're at the mercy of the market. You might think you're going in, getting an interest rate of six and a half percent, and all of a sudden the market explodes and now you're at seven and a quarter percent. Um, so it could change your whole thing, but you're locked into that contract now. So, but on refinance, refinance, the beautiful thing is day one, here's the rate, let's lock it in and let's move this forward. We don't have to wait for a contract to be signed. We don't have to wait you know, for a seller to let somebody in, we don't, you know, there's a lot of different yep. things. There's less outside forces going on. So um, long story short, when rates start coming down, people Good start option. hearing the buzz, you know, just reach out. And that that's sort of how you think about it. Yeah, I love it. I'm aware of the time. So, I, but Jesse, I want to ask you in terms of the the process, is it relatively boilerplate? Like are people, you you go through and you check all the boxes, you know, Keith was just talking about making sure, you know, you've got, you, you go through, you, make, you do the equation, you make sure it's all right. For the closing process, uh, at least in New York, is it a negotiation or is it really just, you know, checking down a big list of things that, uh, you know, and how long does that take? As Keith was saying, it can be a, quite a process. Well, I, so I assume you're talking about the contract process when we're negotiating. Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 you know, Rob finds you an apartment, and you're pre-approved with Keith, and you come to me. I'm usually the last of the three of Holy us. Holy Trinity! That, <laughs> right, right. But the last point in that Trinity um, to to come and talk to me, and you say, "Okay, we have a deal. Like, what what more needs to be done here?" Generally, there is a boilerplate contract um, for co-ops, a separate boilerplate for condos, a separate boilerplate for let's call it you know residential homes. Um, but most attorneys are adding. Um, a rider to that agreement, which is a separate set of contract terms that can vary greatly from deal to deal. Um, and so, I mean, there's there's two parts of what I do at this contract stage. One I briefly mentioned before, which I think is maybe the most important, which is a due diligence into the um, co-op or condo and, and even on homes, I'm doing some limited due diligence looking at city records. That's something that you need to get done at that stage because there is no later stage where you could find out something you don't like and say, I want out. The contract says you can't do that. So okay. we need to make sure, like this place, not just the view, not just the floors, not just the you know countertops, but know a lot about the building that you're buying in. Because if you find something out later that you don't like after you signed a contract, somewhere in that contract where you probably didn't read, it says you can't get out. And you've put down a deposit and your deposit's at risk. So the long, I guess the long answer to your question is, um, you know, no, I mean, I think the, the 
number one, you're putting a deposit down that is at risk if you don't know what's in the contract that you need somebody to explain to you what's in there. Um, number two, the contracts can vary greatly from deal to deal. And there's nothing stopping a seller's attorney if you're buying um, from putting something dangerous in the contract that you may miss if you don't have a you know, diligent attorney looking at it. Okay, good to know. Excellent pitch. Um, Rob, I want to close out just in terms of you because this timeline idea from someone who, you know, at the very beginning of the process to the, the very end, and I know this will vary depending on, as we've highlighted tonight, it, the most important thing is that it varies and yeah. the individual and the place and that, and I completely get that. But what kind of indication do you give people, you know, if they come to you and say, like, I want to buy a house, what are you saying to them in terms of how long it's going to take? I think the first question is, is going to be how long it's going to take for you to decide on the property. Sure. Yep. That, that's that's the most difficult part. Um, once you've decided on, I guess, the type of property, uh, as uh, as I think Keith mentioned, a, a, a co-op can take would take a minimum of, at the very best, sixty days, but generally about ninety days and possibly one hundred and twenty days, because you're often waiting for members of the board to meet and review your application. If you're doing that in summer, everyone's away. There's all these delays. Um, for a, a condo or a townhouse, you can generally do that a bit quicker. You can get it, it, it like if you have uh, a finance person that can underwrite you to the, the, the maximum extent they can um, without having to sort of get into the property, you could close in sort of 30 to 45 days um, and, and 60 days is, is a, a, a reasonable number as well. If you're doing cash um, and the seller is ready to move out, um, that speeds up the process again. So it yeah, depends we've... on what, what we're working with and who we're working with on the other side and what they're looking for. Yeah, I think it's I important. Can... I think, sorry, I think it's just one last thing. I think it's important as far as the process goes, like let's say they reach out to Rob. Rob usually is going to refer them and say, hey, did you, do you have a pre-approval? Yes. Have you gotten your finances in order? Because Rob, the last thing Rob wants to do and the last thing the buyer wants to do is go out looking and find, oh my God, I found this great place. And then they reach out to me then and they can't either a certainly can't get qualified, but also can't even get a get a pre approval, so they're not going to get their offer accepted. They've wasted already weeks of trying yeah. to find. Something. You're spinning your wheels. I mean, that, that's the that's that's like at the end of our initial conversation. It's like, do you have a lawyer? Have have you been pre approved? And if you haven't, I recommend, you know, these two. Keith and Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. But getting it done. Yeah. Yep. Getting it done. Yeah. I love it. Rob Schletterer from Compass, Keith Fuhrer from Guard Hill Financial, and Jesse Cohn from HHNK Attorneys. I want to thank you all. I know we could have probably gone for another hour, and I'm sure we'll have lots of follow-ups. We can work out, a, work out another way to keep talking. But this has been, I mean, a great summary. I think there's going to be lots of follow-ups. What we're going to do for everyone watching is we're going to send all the details of uh, these three panelists out to everyone, and you'll have the opportunity to ask, send questions or, you know, more to point engage and, and get connected and, and start the process with them. I'll make sure that, uh, yeah, you'll get some uh, information about feedback because we'd love to hear what you think of the discussion and the questions and, and what you want to hear because we're, we've got all these expert talents that we want to make sure we're taking advantage of. So, Rob, Keith and Jesse, thank you very much for your time this evening and thank you very much to everyone who joined. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thank you.